Hello everyone and thank you for coming today. Um, I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, we are starting with another week of our practical introduction to machine learning. This week is going to be really interesting. First, starting with our amazing guest lecturer that is going to join us in just a couple of seconds. Just a brief introduction first and then we're going to jump straight to that. Um, before we, we jump to that, uh, this week is the deadline for our uh, homework that we had from the first week and we had something that to be done from the week before, so regression and classification. Uh, this week we are finishing with the first part of this course before jumping straight to the deep learning part, which is going to be more intense. Um, that's going to be more fun as well for me, <laughs> maybe not for you, but yeah. Uh, so now to the speaker. Um, he's my great friend and amazing leader and engineer. Uh, he's Mark Village and um, He's coming uh, live, live from Croatia right now and uh, amazing like trajectory, trajectory of project that he led and, and uh, be part of starting from Styria then to Facebook and now leading crazy amount of engineers in the Photomat as a director of engineer, uh, engineering and uh, he's going to join us and speak about his journey and you can ask him many questions. Um, yeah, so hi Marco. Luca, uh, happy to join you and thanks for the invite and hello to everyone watching this. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us today as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so next 45 minutes to one hour, we're all going to, yeah, basically have a discussion. So you don't have to, um, if you have any topic prepared for us, that, that would be amazing. But if you just want to have a free talk, that, that's going to be fine as well. So it, it's, it's, your, it's your choice. Thanks. I managed to prepare some slides. Uh, I had to do it in speed because I had a working weekend, unfortunately. But let me share my screen. Uh, I will just present some work. So some nice images, maybe. Uh, okay, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the talk is called AI in practice. Uh, and I will present uh, some of my experience, some of the, the projects that uh, I worked as a part of different teams in different companies. Um, and I will speak about what role machine learning played in these uh, projects. Uh, how this was um, embedded in different companies, in different systems, in different businesses, uh, how we got funding, but also what were the challenges, what were the challenges in terms of technology, uh, data sets, uh, cooperation with other teams, integration, and so on. Uh, sorry for any noise in the background. I have small kids that, and they may be loud uh, occasionally, so sorry for that. Uh, okay, um, briefly about myself. So I'm software engineer. Uh, I finished PhD in software in machine learning in 2014. Um, I was entrepreneur uh, for six years uh, in the time of the biggest financial crisis uh, from 2007 to till 2013. Uh, there uh, I was working um, mainly different software engineering projects. Uh, we started with a couple of our own products. They all failed miserably. And then we pivoted to being a software development agency, but that was also really difficult because we were in the local market in the middle of the global crisis. So that was tough. Uh, then after six years, I realized that I need to try something else. Uh, and I joined the university as a machine learning uh, expert. Uh, I was working some data mining there for two years. Uh, then I joined Styria, which is the biggest regional media company. Uh, they wanted to experiment with uh, the big data technologies. Uh, and this is how I got the job. But we pivoted very quickly, as you will see in the, in the lecture, we pivoted very quickly into machine learning. Uh, and uh, approximately at the same time, I, I worked uh, on a couple of projects as independent consultant for Lego. Uh, from 2019, for two years, I was in London at Facebook. 
Uh, and for the last two years, I am at Photomath. I started as uh, head of AI uh, with the idea to build, uh, to ramp up AI developments at Photomath. And uh, for the last year or so, I'm uh, leading the entire engineering, which is approximately 85 engineers in eight teams. Uh, here are some uh, um, references and some nice images. You can see a team from Styria here with Jensen Huang, CEO of NVIDIA. We got one recognition in 2017 for some deep learning work. Uh, and we got the award from NVIDIA, which we were really proud of uh, because the competition was really tough and we were just, you know, small team from Croatia uh, uh, back in 2017 when AI was not so hyped as, as it is today. Uh, what we were working on at that time is visual search. Uh, I will speak more about this project, but here you can see a couple of images that we got from the our client that is Austrian classified portal called Wilhaben. And when we took the, the image of this famous leather jacket of Jensen, these were results from, the, from this classified uh, system. So this is always a fun story to tell. Uh, so before we jump into the different projects that, that we were working on, uh, let me just briefly <clears throat> uh, discuss, maybe, I, I guess for all of you who are now learning machine learning, this is the interesting, quest interesting question. And this will be the interesting question for every company that you join, uh, like it, unless you start your own startups. But if you join some existing company and, if, and you want to do some machine learning there or any kind of work, actually, uh, there will always be a dilemma. Should you build it yourself or should you use the third party uh, API or, or software uh, tool, package, uh, technology, whatever. Uh, and especially now with the advent of these uh, large language models becoming more popular and these APIs existing like ChatGPT and similars, uh, there will there are scenarios where you can use the existing technology but there are also scenarios where you where you where you need and want to build it by yourself and here as you will definitely learn uh, i believe in the course uh, with luca you will see that machine learning solutions depend hugely on data distribution and it's not easy to just take an existing system uh, uh, train on some other data and plug it in on your own data in your in your process that are resulting from your co your company your users uh, uh, and because it's just a different distribution and uh, uh, even though sometimes it seems like the challenge that you are trying to solve is already solved by you know academic community or industry or so on once you try it on your own data it, it you realize that it's actually not solved. Like one example here is very recent from, from Photomath, where we are now working on a project of uh, segmenting image segmentation. So segmenting uh, um, a, a piece of paper with written math expressions. We want to detect different math expressions on the paper. And, you know, one and a half year ago, we were like, okay, there is like a bunch of segmentation approaches, bunch of different uh, image detection algorithms. Sure, we can done it. We can done this. We can do it in a few months. One and a half years later, we are, we are still working on this. Uh, this is one example how difficult it is. Uh, then there is like economic feasibility uh, question. So does it economically make sense to buy third party solution or to develop your own? This is just a matter of calculations where you need to count how many engineering hours and you know FTEs you need to invest in order to develop something versus the cost of these APIs or solutions, licenses or whatever it is. Uh, one more thing you need to think about is the synergies between internal teams and internal organizations. Like if you just uh, plug in some third party API, it's, it's different than if you develop your own and then other teams can use it uh maintenance and customization uh also like can you maintain it once you develop it uh, because development cost is one thing but 
maintaining will take a certain amount of your engineering hours as you go on. Uh, vendor lock-in, if you just buy something, you will probably be locked with this vendor. And on contrary, if you develop it on your own, you are in control. Uh, scalability, like does this vendor offer solution that is scalable that can, uh, because if something works uh, on 1000 users, it doesn't mean that it will work on 1 million users. Um, there are language and business specifics, like if you are working on the language that is not English, uh, does it mean that the, this language model accessible for API will work from your case or not? If not, you will probably need to train your own models. Uh, sales potential in the future. It may be that when you are developing your own technology that you may develop something that you'll be able to sell afterwards. Uh, synergies with existing technologies, like similar like synergies with, with other teams, maybe you can uh, uh, leverage different technologies that already exist in your organization and, and create more output together. Uh, ability to implement cutting edge R&D results. This is interesting because once, if you just plug in third-party solution, you are you do not have control how quickly this solution will develop internally. But if you have experts in your organization, if you have machine learning researchers working in a team, uh, uh, and if they are good and smart and learning quickly, you know maybe they can implement every paper that comes out so if something really important comes out and there is a paper there is code repository out there maybe your team can replicate this result and and uh, customize and you have the access to the latest possible r d in-house in a matter of uh, weeks or months and of course important thing to consider is keeping data and knowledge in-house uh, you need to be especially uh, careful about sending your data to uh, different other systems, other APIs, uh, not just because of the business value of this data, but, but also uh, like uh, security, privacy issues that may come up, uh, also intellectual property, maybe this data is something that will be um, important value uh, and, and asset of, your, of the company that you are working at. And maybe, you know, uh, maybe someone will acquire your company just because you have data that no one else has. And this is becoming increasingly important uh, as uh, many other companies have huge amounts of data and they are capable to develop big models, but maybe your use case, maybe your company differentiates in some way. You cannot uh, be competition to Google, Facebook and uh, you know OpenAI uh, when it comes to training huge language models, uh, but maybe you have this edge with some specific use case and specific data that they do not have. And who knows, maybe one day your company will be acquired just because you have this uh, additional data that can be valuable for them. Uh, okay, so uh, let's jump to some uh, examples of projects. Uh, this is one example from Styria, where we wanted to create uh, image classifier. So this was back from 2016, uh, where we wanted to uh, enable users of this classified site. Classifieds is another name for uh, secondhand sales, where you have used items being sold on on uh, app or website, and we wanted to implement. Uh, the user experience with you when you where user just can take a photo of an item and this will be automatically categorized and they can just you know quickly add uh, the item on the system uh, without much of a hassle and this would improve a uh, user experience and for this we uh, couldn't use just the existing like image net uh, database and train the model or some existing api because of this problem of specific data set distribution. As you can see here, uh, this website and this app is selling like agricultural machines. There is no category like this in the existing uh, APIs and data sets or parts for bicycles or you know different mobile phones and like other, other stuff. So it's, it's like thousands of categories. And for this, we needed to train our own custom models and not just that, we also 
wanted to make it hierarchical, meaning that, uh, like, for example, if uh, the model is not able to predict the exact type of the mobile uh, phone being sold, uh, like Samsung Galaxy Note or whatever, if it's not certain in this, maybe it is better to just say Samsung mobile phone, uh, because in that way, you are saving users click if the wrong prediction was made. So there is there was there were, there were a bunch of reasons why we wanted to train our own, own models, and we decided to build a team in house, uh, and uh, we actually applied with this project in this you know traditional media company that was not, you know they really didn't had a plan to to work uh, cutting edge deep learning, uh, but they had internal competition for you know innovative ideas, and we applied with this project and we got the funding in this way. Luckily, there was like understanding in the management this, that this is needed. Uh, and we were based as a R and D team that was then selling this solution to other members of this uh, news corporation. And they were buying this as, as API from us. Uh, one interesting thing, thing here is uh, that back then, so this is the screenshot. Uh, from that time where we actually were on par or even better than the existing APIs that were offered then by Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Google, CloudSite, Clarify, and so on. And the, the reason why we, we had this uh, uh, edge is exactly like this detailed, fine-grained labels and data that we had. And this is what what I said. This is what I meant when I when I uh, said that you know you can then maybe turn your research into your own product. And we we wanted to uh, expose this as an API to the market for other classifieds to use. And we actually managed to do this. And we actually managed to sell this to other uh, uh, other classifieds. Uh, and we wanted to create spin off company that would do just this uh but you know eventually like after a couple of years trying this uh management in in austria uh didn't really recognize this as a potential uh for for you know business because it was not the core business of this company it's a media company and they have fine revenue from you know selling newspapers and that was uh, that was it uh, but this is a nice example how you can like create something that is really special on the market just because you have a really nice data uh, and one more um, one more thing that i would like to add here related to this project is uh, this paper from 2012 actually it's called hedging your bets uh, and here uh, uh, this is example where we uh, used this approach and actually built on top of this paper and turn this like scientific concept into something really really practical for this classified use and here the question is uh, the here the idea is like on the on the first image like it's easy image it has a kangaroo and you just predict it's a kangaroo and everything is fine but if you have some hard image like this one and this is of course artificial example that is part kangaroo part zebra and part you know buffalo you do not want to create a wrong prediction you want to generalize that it's a mammal and this was really convenient for our use case that i was describing a moment ago, ago with example of samsung phones we wanted to save user clicks and this is example where we didn't just optimize solution for accuracy like something that you would traditionally do in you know your typical machine learning project we wanted to optimize on the user experience and this is where uh, this paper hedging your bets really was uh, uh, useful for us <clears throat> when it comes to performance uh, these are some met metri metrics that resulted from this project where you can see that we <clears throat> uh, say we, we had accuracy of more than 90 percent but at the same time, we saved user clicks, like on average, 2.7 user clicks. So on average, user would, would need to click 3.1 times uh, drilling down the hierarchy tree to place an ad. 
and there were four levels in, in hierarchy of categories. And we saved 2.7 on average. Uh, and in the leaf level, we were 72% uh, correct. Uh, so it, in other words, users had to do only 0 0.4 clicks on average to place an ad, which was, uh, uh, which reduced ad insertion time by 73%, which was amazing benefit like in business steps. Uh, in a survey that we did with customers of this classified, 95% of, uh, of customers gave the top grade to this new feature, and it is now uh, implemented in the in the app for a couple of years now. Uh, the other case, also computer vision related, is uh, the example that is on the same business or classified business, but on the other side of uh, transaction. So the first one was for sellers, people who are placing an ad who want to sell object. And this one was for buyers, for people who want to buy, uh, who want to search for things like in the same way, like Pinterest, for example, is doing search of images. And here we had the challenge that, again, like pointing out like this specific data driven decisions that we had to do and data driven R&D that we need to do in house. And there was no existing solution on market for this. And this is uh, the specifics where sometimes you need to optimize for searching the category, but sometimes you need to optimize for searching like really, really uh, visual features. And there are differences between two. So in the first row, you can see that like the, the leftmost, Im leftmost image is the input image of a cap. And to the right are other winter caps. But uh, in the second row, so the first row is example of search within a category. And the second row is example of search within uh, a category, but with the emphasis on visual features where we need like red evening dresses that look really, really similar to each other. Uh, and we achieved this by fine tuning the, uh, which parts of the, which visual features that are resulting from the convolutional neural network participate uh, to which extent in the search. So uh, just, just brief, like briefly about these models. So you have input image on the, on the input side, then you have a visual network, a visual uh, convolutional neural network, visual computer vision network that is learning uh, feature representations from uh, uh, low level features like detecting edges, colors, textures, and so on towards higher uh, uh, abstract, more abstract concepts. And when we do this search, we want, we want to emphasize differently these low level features and high level hierarchical like abstract features. Uh, and the third row uh, presents something that was like also quite a remarkable result uh, uh, coming out from the pure research part of work where we were able to learn the classifier uh, uh, to, to recognize these brands. Like you can see here Nike, all these sneakers are Nike sneakers. And we didn't have the labels. You will you will see on the course how labels are important uh, together with the data points for learning the models. And here we didn't have labels. Like we didn't know where in the image it says Nike, but there were texts along with these ads. So when someone was selling Nike shoes, they would usually write, I'm selling Nike shoes. They are not really like worn number this and this size and so on and we were able to do nlp uh, analysis natural language processing analysis that they extracted the most informative words with respect to a category and these turned out to be brands quite commonly or some materials and so on and this is where we uh forced computer vision algorithm to learn not just the category, but also trying to predict these most informative words from the description of ad. And 
it turned out that it was able to learn where these logos are in the image on it on it on itself and these are examples of results that you wouldn't be able to achieve with you know just using third party like api or solution or whatever you really need to do your own r d in-house and have a like great engineers and research scientists uh, doing this work uh, and this is another example of uh, visual search on uh, Wilhaben, which is Austrian uh, classified site. And here are some examples with uh, clothes and antiquities, lamps, and so on. Uh, and then there are some examples of natural language processing uh, work that we did back at Styria. You can see here that, uh, so this is way before ChatGPT. This is also 2016 or so, 15 or 16. Uh, and here you can see uh, uh, representations of uh, different uh, words uh, coming out from news articles in Croatian here, uh, with uh, uh, on, presented with TSNE technique, uh, projected in two-dimensional space. And what you can see, although this lot of this is written in Croatian, but you can see here like. For example, Justin Bieber, Madonna, Jennifer Lopez, Rihanna, and so on. So these are some singers uh, uh, grouped together. You know, automobile, automobile, uh, crash, autobus, uh, and so on. So these are some vehicles grouped together. So this is like examples how these models were able to learn. And this visualization was really important for us because this is where we how we presented this to management and we said you know there is something here we can do something give us resources to employ like one additional engineer to do this work and then they like accepted this we got the funding and we created this uh, news recommender for uh, one news portal this is which is called 24 sata uh it was uh deployed on our GPUs, on our server servers in early 2016. One of the first like recommenders deployed on GPUs that I know of. Uh, we got the uh, click-through rate uplift of 36.2%. It was able to handle more than 3 million daily API calls. And it was embeddable on, on websites with this widget. So it was really a blast uh, back then. Uh, we also had like one secondary uh, output of this research was our own spell checking prototype that uh, we were able to develop uh, based on this same language model that was able to learn the context and you know offer uh, like great uh, good uh, of suggest like like the Grammarly you've probably heard about Grammarly so this was similar but we had much smaller uh data set for training than, than, than grammarly of obviously uh but it was interesting uh, result uh here is one example of the work that i did for lego uh, uh and this work actually got uh, patented and the patent was approved uh, a few years ago uh, the goal here was to develop uh, computer vision models that will be able to recognize bricks and you know minifigures and so on uh, and this is all the public uh, information so i'm not disclosing anything sensitive here but uh, uh, the point here is that uh, like in the first company like the styria i uh, we had a team that was built inside the company for lego i worked as an external consultant and it, it's i'm just showing this to illustrate how different dynamics is like with Lego, the development was much slower because for every project, there was, you know, RFP, uh, uh, standard process of approvals. Uh, then you get fixed uh, deadlines and you get limited budget and you do the work and you deliver and so on. Uh, it's much slower with uh, in terms of iterations and so on. Uh, but of course, they... Uh, also had some internal people working on this stuff and later on they were uh, developing their own team and they uh, um, managed to implement some of these things in their own products as well so this is also like really really interesting work for them and i really enjoyed working on this 
uh, then about Facebook, obviously, about I, I, I can't talk a lot uh, about technical details of work for Lego or Facebook, uh, but you know, just for illustration, <clears throat> here is the link of uh, one publicly available uh, article and, and a video where that you can look to see how Facebook is doing uh, uh, machine learning to uh, personalize ads. Uh, and what I think is in interesting for you as you know people who are um, who want to learn uh, uh, machine learning and engineering behind it, uh, you will probably learn about metrics and how it's important to have a metric and then your model optimizes for the metric. Uh, here uh, it's really interested that it's interesting how, Facebook is doing uh, optimization. So Facebook is not optimizing just on, you know, revenue because that would lead to unwanted uh, situations. You can you can always optimize for one thing, and you know, model will learn this one thing, and it will optimize for this one thing. But the side effects can be uh, that you are hurting your business in the short term. So mm -hmm. if Facebook optimizes just for revenue, there will be a bunch of you know crappy ads that users won't like and it will ruin users experience and this is why uh, they also have this component of ad quality uh, that is saying how this ad is valuable to the user and what we want to achieve here is we want to optimize for the entire value for the total value of the system so it's it's an economy happening on facebook platform it's the same with google and other other adver advertisers as well uh, so you have economic value, value of the transaction that you want to increase. So, and he, this is where the auction comes into play. So advertisers make bids. They say how much they are willing to pay for the conversion to happen. Uh, and uh, then there is a component of how this ad is useful for this user. And then combined, this gives the total value that uh, you are optimizing for. And the machine learning system is then optimizing for this value. Uh, my team specifically was working on the system that was, that is optimizing for one uh, uh, one kind, one one aspect of this traffic, uh, one kind of of conversions. Of course, it's it, it's a huge team. It's an entire ads organization and a lot of great engineers and a lot of great product managers uh, working on this system. And it's a really big and complex system behind. Uh, apart from these <clears throat> like technical aspects, uh, one thing that one one aspect of work that I was not expecting to learn at Facebook uh, and, and that happened is actually how um, these companies are doing management and how these companies are because this was my first time working on this huge company i worked at, at much smaller companies before and here i here i learned how to scale how to scale not just systems but how to scale organization how to scale teams and this is where concept of engineering management comes in where um it's really important uh, to understand what is the role of the engineering manager and how this role enables the scaling of teams and efforts and, and uh, working on many different teams on many different product projects uh, together uh, uh, without creating a big mess, you know. <laughs> so it was really a great learning, like organizational aspect of this. <clears throat> uh, and then I joined Photomath, where I um, actually employed a bunch of this knowledge, like from all these uh, companies before, uh, and we uh, we were able to scale the team quite quickly. Uh, so I started uh, as head of AI with just a couple of engineers, uh, but we employed. Uh, AI researchers, data engineers, backend engineers, DevOps engineers, and so on. And we created a team of 20 people that was delivering like really good stuff and delivered a couple of projects in less than uh, nine months. Uh, and this is where companies said, okay, like this is really interested. Let's try to do this 
with other teams and uh, this is how I got to this new role of being director of engineering where we want to you know assemble the organization that will work as efficiently as possible with the great engineering output but the satisfied people at the same time uh, but just uh, coming back to like what Format is doing like in the first place if, if you are not familiar so it's an app it's it's actually the best ranking at tech app for learning math uh, that takes uh, that allows users to take a picture of a math problem and then delivers a solution with explanations step-by-step -step solutions animations so it really like enables not just uh, un, uh, students to get unstuck on some math problem but also helps them learn with offering great content and there is an entire organization and bunch of uh, creative uh, uh, math experts that are working on these solutions and animations and trying to optimize uh, how kids uh, can learn math and here the role of machine learning is in uh, understanding what user wants so this is like obviously computer vision task and but it's not just computer vision it's also like uh, there is a natural language component there of course uh, we want to be able to understand what user needs what the problem is about we want to also find the solution and we want to deliver relevant content uh, and then there is also a bunch of internal optimizations that uh, can be done with machine learning so like really really huge amount of opportunities for machine learning work and this is why we uh, expanded this team so uh, to be so big um, one of the things one of the most important learnings from all of these uh, companies uh, would be that uh, for success you need to have a team that is not just machine learning engineers you need end-to-end -end team you need people who can do data engineering you need someone who is doing product manager even in your team or in other teams or in product management organization if there is uh, this kind of organization in the company uh, you need someone to do the infrastructure you need the devops engineers uh, you need mlops uh, how are you training models at scale how are you uh, maintaining your models how are you keeping them fresh preventing them from being stalled uh, you will learn on the course about data drift and how these models can, you know, soon become obsolete if your data distribution if change, is changing over time. Uh, so there is a uh, there is a lot more uh, on top of just machine learning when it comes to machine learning models in the in practice. Uh, and one more important learning. So the first one was end-to-end -end teams. The second one is aligned incentives uh we had a bunch of uh, failed projects as well and like for example Setsteria, uh i sh i showed a couple of successful projects like uh, computer vision for classifieds a recommender system for ads and so on but there was one big bet where we spent huge amounts of resources and that was personalization of the news portal that project failed because uh, in my opinion the main reason was that incentives were, were not aligned between different teams in the company, like in, in a wider context. Uh, and this is the, the, the job of management. So management needs to be able to understand what is the value of the things that you are working on and to incentivize other teams to help you uh, instead of creating, creating frictions, blockers, you know, uh, every team fighting for their own cause, you know hiding things from each other blocking each other so these are all things that can happen if you do not have aligned incentives like common goal that then translates to uh, uh basically you know managers of these teams their bonuses their goals this needs to be aligned at photomat it's a good situation when it comes to that and this is why we are way more successful than than, than before uh, so thank you. This was really brief overview of the projects uh, that I worked on, some challenges, some learnings. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer.
को It's all the matter of scale. Like we have really a big amount of users, big amount of images, and we can collect uh, huge amounts of data. And we have internally uh, our own uh, data labeling operation, data annotation operation, uh, and uh, systems for data labeling. Uh, and this is uh, how we are mitigating this. Like it's. But once you collect big, huge amounts of data, and once you annotate all these data, it, uh, different <clears throat> like handwritten stars and so on, they cancel each other out, or um, basically your model learns all of them. Uh, so handwritten mostly is not a problem for us anymore, just because we have huge amounts of data. These models are so powerful to learn this. In the first versions, we were relying on the OCR technology, like optical uh, optical character recognition, where we were recognizing one symbol at a time. Uh, but we moved away from that towards the end-to-end -end model, and this is a project where actually Luca was also working on. Uh, we call it into math, where we have image on the input and math expression on the output. Uh, and this model is able to learn really like amazing things. So even if there is like, uh, for example, you have a vector x, y, z. And if this z is like written in a really bad uh, handwriting, uh, this model will figure out that it, it, it's supposed to be z because of the context. Because usually this vector is like x, y, z. Uh, the same goes even if the like if, if math problems are not captured entirely within the screen, uh, if it's like 4a plus 3b plus 2c, like if the c is cut off, the model will figure out that it's, it's supposed to be c, just because it, it has seen so many examples, so many images of this type that it was able to learn the context. Uh, yeah, so when it comes to labeling, like, there are different scenarios. Like, for example, at Styria, users were labeling our data. So we had uh, classified ads that were put in the category by users themselves. When they were selling something, they put in a category. And this was the label for us to learn. Also, the text, like on examples that I presented, like the text was also labeled. We, we were able to extract important information from this text and use this as a label. So there are situation, situations where you can be creative and find your own existing labels in the data set. And there are also like approaches where you can use, where you can use like semi-supervised techniques mm -hmm. uh, or self-supervised techniques uh, for labeling. For example, if you are rotating the image and learning that it's the same image, but rotating, you are actually like generating artificial label at the time. Uh, but sometimes, of course, you need to have data labeling machinery like we have at Photomath. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to using third party tools or third party companies, it's possible, it's doable, especially if you are proto in prototyping phase and you need something quickly uh but uh for our cases it turned out that uh, nothing is external was good enough uh for example on this segmentation problem we used one uh, third party tool uh but you know, it worked for first few thousand images and then it got extremely slow so we had to build uh, the system on our own and uh, the another thing is that only through 
iterations, you learn what kind of labels you need to have. For example, for math expression segmentation, we only like after a couple of iterations, we learned what kinds of labels we need. We we figured out that you know we need groupings of labels because we need to be able to understand what are what math sub problems are part of the bigger problem and then we realize that, that we, need, we need hierarchical labels uh you know mm -hmm. that we need like uh, there is an element in the textbook where users students need to fill in the answers so this is like separate kind of label and so on but you you cannot predict all of the things up front sometimes you learn for trial and error and it's it's best if you can organize your labeling and your tooling for labeling in house that's the best case it's not feasible always it's expensive it takes work it needs organizational work and so on and when it comes to uh, uh solving uh, wrong labels there will be mistakes in labeling but there are uh, uh techniques to to uh, solve this for example you can have two or three people labeling the same thing without knowing and then you have majority vote or if you have two people labeling the same thing, if there is like dispute, then you have the third person coming in and you know figuring out what it is. Uh, then there is also like the quality control. Even if you do not have more people say label, if that's too expensive for you, you can have random quality control uh, employed where you just sample randomly and, and checking whether things are labeled correctly, and then you propagating back to the team and so on but it's a yeah it's a it's a story on its own and it's a, like a big operation it takes experience you need to have people who know how to do this stuff and it's cool uh, thanks so much uh for the question uh, for the answer detailed answer really by the way i was on mute <laughs> so people could hear you but they couldn't hear me at all uh but yeah uh so uh circling back to the uh, first thing that you or the second thing that you've spoken about like the visual search um people asked like about uh, how how did you handle or did you handle at all like false positive predictions of brand names like that when that comes there might be like some legal, legal issues stuff like that and uh, when they when they have like a knockoffs or fake copies or stuff like that R interesting question i don't know how i would solve that for example yeah we didn't we we were not solving this yeah uh, so you know if someone is selling uh, uh counterfeit uh, products on this uh, platform it's you know mm. it, it's a uh, it's a question of uh it's it's for customer support or legal or mm -hmm. you know they need to figure out that uh, but th there are systems in place operationally in this business that are able to detect these things you know if someone is suddenly selling a bunch of new nike shoes it's suspicious you know uh and there will be some audit and someone will you know call this person and ask you know what what are you doing like yeah. is this legal and they can ban their their account so there are techniques how you solve this on the operational on the business side you do not need to solve all problems with machine learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, cool. And we had a couple. Of, we have a couple of more questions regarding general, general, general things in for beginners, like uh, libraries that or frameworks that you personally recommend or that you find useful throughout working on many different projects. And for example, like. Uh, you worked at Meta, and Meta use, uh, uses PyTorch primarily because they made it. Uh, do you find that to be good for a beginner who wants to work, for example, in computer vision or something else? Mm. Uh, it's a good question. So we we uh, went through the you know plethora of these frameworks. Like when we started uh, at Styria, uh, there was Teano, mm -hmm. and there was Cafe, uh, Cafe first version uh then two years later there was tensorflow uh, and then we switched to tensorflow a couple of years later pytorch uh, came out and then we switched uh, to pytorch uh so now we are using pytorch and mostly python for uh, you know coding around it and uh, go for some uh load uh, heavy operations uh that need to be fast in production uh but you know 
uh, yeah, PyTorch is good for beginners. It's intuitive. Uh, it's uh, easy to learn, uh, but do not uh, get blindsided, uh, sighted with you know framework or technology. Uh, this will change. You know, two years from now, it may be another framework. Uh, uh, learn fundamentals. Learn basic basics. Learn principles, and you know start with something it doesn't mean that you will do the same thing two years from now maybe you'll switch to something else but if you are good with in principles with in fundamentals you are you will quickly switch to another one if it, it, it will be needed do not worry about that too much uh also it may de depend on the company that you join maybe they will use you know tensorflow to use tensorflow whatever cool and um yeah, uh, but it's always like with all the tools right now available for us, it's really difficult as a beginner to choose like what, where do you go from? Um, mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and uh, like how many models uh, are generally um, in, in the production? Like because like the work scaled with a number of models that needs to be observed uh, in the production. So people asked like how many models are they generally in final product? and how many how they're integrated uh yeah that's also a great question um there is depending on the business like but usually you have a bunch of models like big companies have a bunch of models uh we also have a couple of models in production uh but the tendency is that uh, uh for the things that you can group together it's usually beneficial to group them together. And this is where multitask uh, machine learning comes into play, uh, where you can like in computer vision, for example, you, but it's also like, it can be in different domains, but if the domain is just computer vision, if you have problem, let's say one problem is for classification, the second uh, one problem is a visual search that uh, with embeddings the third one is like logos detection detection or, or segmentation or whatever there is a tendency to to use the same backbone like you can have the same uh, model for the backbone and then you can have different heads of the model working on for learning specific tasks and he, with this you can simplify your production to a certain extent and you can benefit from this model having to learn wider contexts on wider data sets uh and and you know you can have you can increase the accuracy actually uh with this approach uh but it all all depends on the use case depends on the infrastructure that you have uh sometimes you have a bunch of models sometimes you have one big model that is multitask it depends no no, no really strict rule there but you know you need to simplify things as much as you can because every new model in production means new maintenance, new support, like additional maintenance, additional support. And uh, people tend to forget that, you know, if you have 10 engineers uh, and they deliver 10 models in, in three years' time, they cannot maintain all these 10 models anymore. You know, it's, it becomes... Uh, there is some work that needs to be done, like refreshing these models, maintaining, and so on. So, it, it, you need to be careful with this uh, when you do when you do your planning, especially when it comes to setting expectations with management in terms of host, costs, headcounts, uh, infra mm -hmm. uh, work that needs to be done, and so on. Makes sense. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, I I'll ask you one more question that is regarding uh career wise one fun question and then we are cutting this off because uh you you have like it's uh, late at night for you so one fun question is um jan lacun uh said, uh said that uh chat gpt is stupid and it's only for writing aid what's your not <laughs> opinion not on him <laughs> but on chat gpt and the other question regarding career wise uh, for somebody who is just starting in machine learning, do you find more useful for them to join some startup and contribute there or go into some big com company as, for example, Facebook or, or, or now Meta or Google or stuff like that? Okay, uh, so the first question, 
these models are great like they are really like they are useful for uh, different kinds of work and you know people are using them and uh, like i used uh, i used it for some programming work where it it uh, shortened my work like something that would take me one day one entire day to figure out i did in 20 minutes or so so there is no dilemma that it's it's useful it is you know it helps people mm -hmm. but at the same time these models do not know what they don't know and they can hallucinate things uh, and you need to take their answers with a grain of salt and check them and uh, also you need to be you need to know how to ask them a question there is like the entire like discipline now with prompt engineering and so on uh, these models are not they cannot solve all the pro all our problems but they can help there are challenges there are issues but they will get better mm -hmm. they are getting better and uh, the thing is that these big companies didn't really want it to put these models out in a way that OpenAI did from for several several reasons possibly like one possible reason one obvious reason is is you know uh, safety and compliance like the aligning problem where you do not want to uh, ruin your reputation with the model that is basically spilling out you know junk uh, but there is also disruption of business models and uh, you know it's a complex issue so it's it's much easier for small smaller so less less uh, not not really smaller but they have huge you know, resources trained on Marcus Microsoft Cloud and so on there is no way that small company can do this model it would take just for training on one GPU it would take you 300 years <laughs> uh, so uh, but you know the open AI had less reputational risk uh, um, so yeah I, I don't know if I answered this question <laughs> hopefully did uh the second question was uh, uh like career uh you know whatever you do where you are developing that's good for you small startup you will learn some set of things there big company you will learn another set of things there uh your career is something that will hopefully be long lasting long term and it's okay to try out different things uh but just don't be don't change jobs too often it, that will be counterproductive and it doesn't look well uh, on on cv uh but um uh, in general like change environments from time to time try out different things why not join a startup? Why not join a big company if you can? It also depends on the you know economic cycle and the, the phase in econ economic cycle where we are. It's not so easy to join fan companies like it was six months ago. Uh, so maybe joining like smaller startup is uh, uh, is a, is better choice. I don't know. What wherever you feel like you are growing and learning, it's a good setup. You will learn something. Also, starting your own startup that's also great. <laughs> the, the the most difficult choice, but yeah, great. <laughs> cool. Uh, that would be all for for today. Thank you so much for joining us and for amazing insights that you gave us. Uh, it was really beneficial for me as well. Uh, hopefully for the audience uh, as well. Uh, thank you for great questions, guys. And uh, yeah, so that's it for today. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the next uh, the next time that we can meet is this Wednesday for the office hours and obviously Friday for the continuing of uh, our lessons. So yeah, see you, see you in two days. Have a great day. Bye.